Okay, recording is on. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the course BC213, our, our course on the end times. Uh, looking forward to a, a good time of study and learning today. Um, let's take a moment, please, just to pray together and we'll start. Could one of us pray? Start. Hello, Shafina, would you want to pray? Yes. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the class we are about to have. God, uh, we just pray that as pastor teaches us, help us to understand each and every single thing that he's teaching. We give us that uh, wisdom, give us that knowledge, help us to open our mind and heart and listen to it. And God, I pray for all my classmates who are about to come and who are in the class, that I pray that we'll have good Wi-Fi connection throughout the sessions and let nothing be a distraction or a disturbance. And I pray and believe that this class will be a blessing to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Good morning once again. Um, welcome to we see 213, our course on the end times. Um, we are in uh, lesson number four, where we are doing an overview, a panoramic view of the sequence of the end time events. Uh, we are going to get started uh, in um, e explaining a little bit about the rapture and why we believe the rapture will take place before the tribulation. We'll give some reasons for that. And then we're going to use uh, get into the book of Re shortly after that. We'll answer a few questions and then get into the book of Revelation. We'll use the book of Revelation as a as an outline of the sequence of events, and so we will be uh, going through that. So we're going to spend you know a couple of weeks on this today, and uh, maybe I think it'll take us maybe two or even three weeks, uh, perhaps more, just to you know go through this whole thing and get a get a good idea of how things are going to happen, the sequence in which things are going to happen. Let me share with us the PDF, the lecture notes. So what happened? Yeah. So we last week we spent time reading uh, these scriptures. Uh, looking at the fact that Christ is coming back, um, I explained a little bit about this chart, uh, high level, are uh, the sequence of events. Then we read these two passages um, where the Apostle Paul tells us in detail uh, about what happens at the coming of the Lord for the church and how we will be raptured to meet with Him in the air. Our bodies will be transformed. We looked at other scriptures uh, that tell us our bodies will be changed, we'll have glorified bodies. The coming of the Lord is like a thief in the night. Uh, we gave a little explanation about the two trumpets. The trumpet sounds when Christ descends. And there's a last trumpet or a second trumpet that brings the gathering of the saints to meet him in the air, meet the Lord in the air. So we explained that. And then we talked about just an outline of, well, these are the things the Bible says uh, we will do in heaven. And you know, most likely all of these things we're going to experience during the seven years when there is tribulation on earth and we are in heaven. So we went through it. We just quickly mentioned it, you know, that the Bible talks about different kinds of crowns um, that are laid up for believers. Um, you know, how how all of this is going to be given, uh, we don't know, but uh, this is what we see in, in the scriptures. And, and you know, these are part of our rewards where God says, you know, to those who endure, to those who uh, live a life that honors him, serves him, they will receive these different crowns. So we covered till that point. Now today, uh, we're going to try and understand 
why we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. That means, if you go back to the chart, uh, why do we say that the rapture of the church, that Jesus is going to come and take the church away, out of the, out of the earth, before the seven years of tribulation? Why do we say that? Now, like we said in the very beginning of this course, there are people who may have a different view. Right? There are some who believe in a mid-tribulation rapture of the church. They believe that somewhere here, in the middle of the seven years, Christ comes for the church. Some who believe, well, it's going to happen at the end. Everything that Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15 will happen here, uh, coinciding with the second coming. So there are different views, and we, we recognize that. But our position is, as indicated in this chart, that the church will be taken out of the way or raptured before the seven years of tribulation. So on what basis do we say that? Why do we say it? What is our reasoning for that? Just want to share that with you. Now, of course, you know, if somebody holds a different view, that's okay. We're not fighting about it. We're not going to become enemies or something. No, it's just that, look, this is what we see in Scripture. This is what we are convinced about. And these are the reasons why. And we will definitely uh, be open to listening to what others have to say, right? We're not fighting about this. We're just trying to explain why we believe in this, uh, why we take this position. So there are six reasons we will go through. First one, uh, and all of, of course, all of this is based on scripture. So let's go first to Second Thessalonians chapter two, and let's read, please, verses one to ten. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses one to ten. Somebody could read that for us, please. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called god or that is worshipped so that he sits as god in the temple of god showing himself that he is god do you do, do you not remember that when i was still with you i told you these things and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work only he who now only who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way and then the lawless one will be revealed whom the lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of satan with all power signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteousness and un, uh, unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved thank you thank you thank you now uh, as we are reading this passage there are some things to keep in mind first the apostle paul when he was physically in Thessalonica on his second missionary journey, when he was there, uh, planting the church, establishing this new church, during that time, while he was there physically, he had taught the believers about the end times. 
So that you can see this in verse 5, 2 Thessalonians 2, 5. He says, do you not remember when I was still with you, I told you these things? So in other words, there's a background to this letter. And much of what he is writing in this letter is, is things that he has already spoken to them in person. You know, so they have already been taught. He's already explained. Secondly, um, the background to all of this is that he has already written some of this in First Thessalonians. So in First Thessalonians, you know, um, many times he talks about the coming of the Lord. So if you will just, um, uh, you know, just quickly glance this with me uh, in First Thessalonians chapter one, in verse ten, he says. Um, we are waiting for his son from heaven. So if you look at 1 Thessalonians 1.10, we are waiting for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So he's saying, we are waiting for Jesus to come. And what's he going to do? He's going to deliver us from the wrath to come. So, it's an indication here that what Paul has taught them and what he's reminding them is Jesus is coming to deliver us, that means take us away from the judgment, the wrath that is coming on the earth, right? from the wrath to come. So that's the first thing. And then as you um, continue on um, in uh, chapter 2, First Thessalonians. Right? I'm just kind of giving the background here. Uh, First Thessalonians 2, verse 19. Once again, he talks about the Lord Jesus. You know, he says, For what is our hope or, or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? That means, hey, when Jesus comes, we're all going to be together with him. And our greatest joy is you are also there with him. Okay, so there's is you know so we can if you piece all this together we can see that um, uh, uh, Paul's picture we can understand Paul's picture about how these events are going to unfold right so that is First Thessalonians two and verse nineteen then again in chapter three verse thirteen once again he's talking referring to the coming of our Lord Jesus he says. You know, um, uh, when the Lord comes, He will establish your hearts blameless in holiness before God and uh, before our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. So He says, Jesus is coming with the saints. Okay, so some are in sight. When Christ comes, He'll come with the saints, right? Then we read First Thessalonians chapter four, verses thirteen to eighteen, where he's saying, "Hey, when the Lord is coming, He will come with the saints." But how is all this going to unfold? And First Thessalonians four thirteen to eighteen, he's giving us details. So uh, he will bring with him those who have fallen asleep, and we who are alive will be caught up together with them. And we will have these glorified bodies and we will meet the Lord in the air. Okay, so you can see the train of thought. Christ is coming. Uh, chapter one Christ is coming. He will deliver us from the wrath to come. Christ is coming. We're all going to rejoice with him together. Christ is coming. Uh, he's coming with the saints. Then he's coming with the saints. The saints will come. They will all, uh, we will, we, they will receive glorified bodies. Uh, we will also be caught up. We will meet with him. In the air. Then First Thessalonians chapter five, verses one to eleven, he says, "Hey, this coming is uh, like a thief in the night, meaning we don't know when he's coming. Uh, he, uh, so we just have to be ready. Ready. We have to live like children of light. And again, once again, he he mentions in this First Thessalonians five, uh, uh, chapter five, verse nine. He says." God didn't appoint us to wrath. I mean, God is not sending us into judgment, but we are going to experience salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, that is in the context of Christ's coming. Now, when we go into chapter 2 Thessalonians, Paul is continuing to talk about the coming of the Lord. And so 2 Thessalonians 
chapter one, again he says, you know, um, uh, when the when the Lord Jesus revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, he's going to take vengeance on those who do not know God, those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, sec Second Thessalonians chapter one. Now he's talking about something else. He's talking about the Lord coming with vengeance. Uh, coming in, in heaven with his mighty angels to take vengeance on those who do not obey the gospel. This is slightly different from what he has described in 1 Thessalonians 4, where he's coming and we are going to be together in his presence. We're going to have joy and we, he's coming with the saints and we are going to uh, be with him uh, uh, forever. Right? So here, the shift has been. So 1 Thessalonians, he's talking about us meeting with the Lord in the air. 2 Thessalonians, hey, he's coming. He's coming, but this time he's coming uh, with mighty angels and flaming fire, uh, you know, uh, to take vengeance on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, and then verse 10, um, this is first, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. And when he comes in that day, he will be glorified in his saints and be admired among all who believe. So you're getting the picture here of there are different things happening. One, he's coming, he's coming with the, with the saints, and we're going to meet him in the air. Second, he's, he's also coming, and he's going to take judgment and vengeance on those who do not obey the gospel, right? So one, he's coming for the church, 1 Thessalonians 4. Another is coming uh, to take judgment, to execute judgment, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, right? So the background, Paul has explained all this to the people when he was there in person. He's writing this now. He's kind of... Uh, reminding or recapturing what he has already taught to them. And you can see that the coming of the Lord, there, there are two different um, events or kinds of things that are happening when the Lord comes so far. Okay, So now, in chapter 2, the passage that we just read, Paul is saying, Brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and of a gathering together to him. Ah, so this is with reference to First Thessalonians chapter 4. His coming and our gathering together with him. Right? He says, okay, I want you to, I want to, I want to say some things. And Second Thessalonians 2, 1. Second Thessalonians chapter two verse two he says, you know, don't be disturbed, because in those days there were people who were uh, promoting this wrong idea that the resurrection had already happened. So people were scared. You know, they were worried. Hey, uh, the, the rapture, the resurrection already happened. We are left behind. What is this? Right. So there was this misinformation being spread, and so Paul is addressing that in Second Thessalonians two. Chapter 2, verse 2, he says, you know, don't be troubled by these kinds of news because, he says, look, you got to understand how this is all going to happen. Then he says, you know, the man of sin has to be revealed. He's got to come on the earth. He's got to do his stuff on the earth. And some of the things what he does, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, Paul is quoting actually from Daniel chapter 9, verses 23 to 27, where Daniel spoke about this man of sin. Actually, he speaks about it in chapter 8, 9, chapters 7, 8, and 9, uh, about this man of sin. But this particular thing, verse 4, in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4, Paul is basing it on what Daniel has revealed, that this man of sin will speak blasphemies against God, and he will sit in the temple of God, and he will call himself as God. So Paul is saying, hey, this has to happen. Only then this, you know, all these, end, the things that 
that I spoke to you about will will will, will be fulfilled. And but in order for that man of sin to be revealed, verse 6, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 6. What is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time? So he says, you know, what's holding this man of sin? This is the Antichrist. What's holding this Antichrist from being revealed? So he says, there is, there is something that's restraining or preventing this lawless one, this Antichrist, this son of perdition to be revealed. Then he says in verse 7, 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, but he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Verse 8, and then the lawless one will be revealed. That means he's going to be revealed, and then he's going to do all this stuff. And then at the end of that, the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. That means that's the coming, the second coming of Christ when he comes to execute judgment, right? Which he has referenced in chapter 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, when Christ will come to execute vengeance. But before that happens, the lawless one has to be revealed. But before the lawless one can be revealed, he who restrains will prevent him from being revealed until he is taken out of the way. So now the big question is, who is he? Right? Who is he? Now, there are two possibilities. One, the he could refer to the Holy Spirit, or the he could refer to the church. Now, in our minds, uh, when we think about the church, we always think about the church as she, for whatever reason. She, uh, because the church is the bride of Christ, which is true. The Bible uses that term the bride of Christ. So we think of the church as a she. But remember, and don't forget, the church is the body of Christ. So it's perfectly fine to refer to the church as he, because it is the body of Christ. right? So the church itself is gender neutral, meaning it's not he or she. It's just that there are different pictures of the church. One, it's the bride of Christ, so we tend to think of she. But the church is also the body of Christ. You can think of it as he, if you want to. But really, it's there is no gender to the church. It's just the body of believers, people who have been saved, is a spiritual body uh, uh, who's been saved. So mentally, we find it difficult to accept that the he of 2 Thessalonians 2 7 could refer to the church because they're always thinking church is bright, church is bright, she, she, she. But hey, the church is the body of Christ. And uh, he is the head of the body, right? And he, Christ is, you know, we always refer to Jesus as the Son of God or he. So then the rest of his body is also he, right? So we have. Two possibilities: either the he, Second Thessalonians two seven, the he of the Second Thessalonians two seven refers to the Holy Spirit, or it refers to the Church. Only two possibilities. Now we have to think this through. Does the Bible indicate that the Holy Spirit will be taken away from the Church? So if the so think about it like this. If the Holy Spirit is taken away and the church is left on the earth, then it is breaking, it is violating the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will abide with you forever. So it's not possible for God to remove the Holy Spirit from the earth and leave the church on the earth to go through the tribulation. That, that is, Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will be with you forever. 
the Holy Spirit, if believers need the Holy Spirit anytime, it is definitely when they, if they have been left behind on the earth and have to go through the tribulation, that's when the, the believers need the Holy Spirit the most to strengthen us. So it is actually an absurd thought to think that the Holy Spirit is taken out of the earth and the church is left behind to go through the tribulation without the Holy Spirit. Because really, without the Holy Spirit, we are lost. We cannot be saved. Without the Holy Spirit, we cannot overcome this world. So, let's flip it around. If the church is taken out of the way, then the Holy Spirit is continuing to operate on the earth. Is there indication in Scripture that the Holy Spirit continues to operate on the earth through the tribulation? The answer is yes. And we will see this in the book of Revelation because in the book of Revelation, we find many things. We find that there are a hundred, there are people who will be saved during the tribulation. Well, if you're going to be saved, you have to have the Holy Spirit because He's the Spirit of Sonship. And without Him, you cannot be saved. Second, there are there is there are the hundred and forty four thousand Jews, which we will see Revelation chapter seven and again in chapter fourteen, who are designated by the Lord to preach the gospel during the tribulation. So how can you preach the gospel during the tribulation without the Holy Spirit? It's the Holy Spirit is going to anoint you, and the Bible says very clearly that one hundred and forty four thousand Jews have the mark of God on their forehead. And one of the things the mark of God refers to, or could refer to, is the seal of the Holy Spirit, because the the, the mark of God, uh, the the one of the emblems or symbols of the Holy Spirit is He is the seal. So these hundred forty-four thousand Jews definitely have the Holy Spirit in them. Thirdly, we see that um, one of the people who has who were Killed one of the elders who says, I have the testimony of Jesus. And the testimony of Jesus is simply the spirit of prophecy, the Holy Spirit testifying about Jesus. So the phrase testimony of Jesus is referring to the Holy Spirit testifying about Jesus. And the believers going through the tribulation have the testimony of Jesus, that is the Spirit of God. So we can see very clearly. Uh, and the fourth thing is this. There are two witnesses who operate during the tribulation. These witnesses, we read, we read about them in Revelation 11, they do mighty signs and wonders. They are preaching, they are prophesying. Can you preach, prophesy, and do mighty signs and wonders without the empowering of the Holy Spirit? No. We need the Holy Spirit. So when you put all this together, we can say very clearly that the he of Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 has to refer to the church. The church is taken out of the way, meaning all the believers are taken out of the way. But the Holy Spirit continues operating on the earth, empowering those who believe in Jesus during the tribulation until the end of the tribulation when the Lord comes to execute vengeance on those who do not obey the gospel. Right, so uh, whatever I've said, you know, I've kind of uh, it's in the notes, uh, so you can you know read it. Uh, uh, yeah, I think one point that I did miss is um, that there, there, even Israel will experience a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit, uh, especially at the end of the tribulation, and this is given for us in uh, Zechariah um, chapter twelve, where uh, there will be a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit, right? Um, Zechariah 12, 8, 8 through 10. So, um, once again, the Holy Spirit is going to be working on the earth during the tribulation. So all these reasons I've, uh, which I've shared, I've outlined here, okay? So thinking through this and through 
what Paul has written here in Second Thessalonians, putting it in context of what he has spoken to them, what he has already described in First Thessalonians, and the way he's put everything together, uh, you know, through First Thessalonians into Second Thessalonians, and then trying to understand who is he referring to. He uh, has to be the church, not the Holy Spirit. We can be very convinced that, okay, when the church is taken out of the way, then the Antichrist is revealed. Then he's going to do all these things that Paul wrote about, that he's going to speak blasphemous things about God. He's going to, you know, uh, set himself up as God and all that. Then Christ returns to execute vengeance on those who do not obey the gospel. Now, that's the day of the Lord that, we had, that he refers to. Okay? So let me pause here and see uh, if you have any questions on this first point. Is it clear? Uh, is it clear? Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Uh, mentioned uh, regarding the work of the Holy Spirit even during the time of tribulation. So um, I was just wondering, Pastor Rick, so would there be even born again believers who are left behind? Um, or is there any specific uh, criteria? Because uh, we recently had a boy who uh, came and asked for a prayer request that please pray that I would be taken up in the rapture. Hmm. So, um, so I'm just trying to connect with these uh, two uh, thoughts. Um, as uh, you mentioned, that there would be people here uh, left behind that understood, but I'm just trying to understand how um, how that is possible uh, with the work of the Holy Spirit. Sure. Sure. So one is um, there will be new people who believe in Jesus Christ as soon as the rapture happens, right? So imagine, you know, today we have uh, so many billions of people on the earth. They are listening to the church. Some of them are listening to the church saying, you know, this is what the Bible is saying. They're all, they may be laughing at us today. But when the rapture happens and believers are taken out of the earth, it is going to be a shocking thing for the whole world, right? Imagine believers disappearing. So that is immediately going to result in millions of people, at least thousands of people, becoming believers in Jesus Christ. They say, yes, the Bible is true. Everything that's written in the Bible has just happened. Let's go to the Bible. Let's read it. Let's get ourselves ready. And then, of course, all these sermons, everything that we have been preaching you know, all over the world, things on television and internet and books, people are going to go and read it and say, hey, what they said. So there's literally going to be thousands, probably millions of people who will get saved the day the rapture occurs. So they're going to be believers through that next seven years. The question is, would some of us who are believers today get left behind when Jesus comes for the church? Now, how do we address that? There are two things to look at. One is, there is clear warning in the scriptures for believers to live in a state of readiness. One of the passages we read, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he says, hey, you are children of light. Don't live like people of darkness. Live as children of light because you don't know the day of the Lord's coming. Be ready all the time. And that's repeated. You know, Romans 13, he repeats that. And even the Lord Jesus, in Matthew 24, he gave us those exhortations. He said, you know, uh, you, you have to live in a state of readiness. You have to be faithful in doing what, what the Lord has given you. So that's one side to it. Obviously, such warnings would not have been given if the pause, there was no possibility of people uh, going astray. So that's why there is the warning that we've got to be live soberly as in the day. But understand the rapture is actually a salvation. We are being saved from the wrath to come. That's that's why the Lord is coming, taking us out of the way. So it's it's part of our salvation. Now, salvation we know is a gift. It is a gift of grace. It is not by works. So, what can we say? We have to put these two together. That means we have to hold both these truths. Both are truths. 
both are found in the Bible and both have to be held together. How do we, so what can we say? We can say this, that salvation is a work of grace. So if any person who's saved, who's born again, saved by grace, will experience salvation. That means this is part of our salvation, which is to, if we are alive at the coming of the Lord, then this is part of our salvation. We're going to be taken up, and salvation is a work of grace. So we can say that every person who is genuinely saved, who is alive at that time, will be taken up. But it is also important that we live right. We live in a state of readiness. So the question is, I mean, again, let's create a hypothetical situation. If the first trumpet sounds, and that moment, a believer has an evil thought. This is a hypothetical situation. We're thinking through this, right? The trumpet sounds, and the Lord is descending from heaven. And that instant, a believer has a dirty thought, an evil thought. Now, an evil thought, or he starts thinking evil, or he might say an angry word, uh, he might get angry, or that moment, that instant, he does something that is sin. Question, will he get left behind? Because one sin is enough to send us to hell. Right? He's a good believer. Maybe he's a man of God. Let's say he's a prophet of God, he's an apostle of God, whatever. That moment when the trumpet in heaven sounds, Christ is descending, that moment he commits a sin. So let's say some small sin, but it's a sin, a small thing. Question is, will he get left behind? Because he has sinned that instant in the twinkling of an eye, everything's going to happen. Will he get left behind? No, we will say, hey, he's a man of God. He, he won't get left behind. But remember, he has sinned. He hasn't had time to re repent yet. He may not even have realized he has committed the sin. But that moment, Christ is descending at that instant. And one sin is enough to send us to hell. Will he get left behind? I'm sure all of us will say no. Why? Because we're saved by grace. Well. If that is going to be true for one sin, it has to be true for everything else. That means, I'm not saying, you know, uh, we can go and live in sin and just as though we are not saved. What I'm saying, what I want to emphasize is, we are saved by grace. And being caught up in the rapture is part of our salvation, which is God's gift to us. And uh, that is by grace. And he has also told us, I'm not denying this, he has told us to live right in readiness for his coming, but an unconfessed sin or a sin itself will not hold us back at that moment because we are saved by grace. So we keep that, hold these two together. So to answer your question, every believer who's been saved by grace will go up in the rapture. Yes, we are people ought not be living, you know, may not be living great lives, but we are saved by grace and going up in the rapture is part of our salvation. Does this mean we should live carelessly? No, because God has instructed us not to live carelessly. He's told us to live soberly uh, as people of light. Right? So we hold both truths together. And uh, yeah, that's how I would, you know, put it all together. Yes, Pastor. Thank you. So for the, for this so from this example, so this. when uh, when uh, when this person has you know comes and says, "Pray for me that I will not get left behind in the rapture," then we have to just assure him of his salvation. Hey, you are saved. Yeah, Christ. The reason the rapture is taking place is He's saving us from the wrath to come, and this is part of your salvation. Be assured of your salvation. 
you're not sure of your salvation, then be assured of it. Pray, make sure that you are saved. And if you're saved and you're walking with God, yeah. Okay. So any questions on 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7? The first reason why we believe the rapture will take place before the tribulation. Any questions on that? Is it clear? Okay. All right. Anyone else uh, in the class? Any questions? There are no questions. We will move forward. Okay. So let's go into the second uh, reason on why we say the rapture will take place before the church. And this is found in Paul's writings to the Thessalonians, which we have already read. In Paul's writings to the Thessalonians, where you know the theme of the end times and the coming of the Lord for the church and the coming of the Lord to execute judgment uh, is, is, is an important part of both First and Second Thessalonians. In all of this, Paul twice he tells us that the coming of the Lord is for us to escape the wrath to come, the wrath to come. So he's saying, look, uh, this is First Thessalonians 1.10. We are waiting for the Lord to come from heaven, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come, the judgment to come. The wrath simply is another word for, you know, what he's referring to as the judgment to come. And Again, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 to 11, it says, God did not appoint us to wrath, to undergo the judgment. Now, when you look at the judgment, it's, it's a broad term. There is, of course, wrath or judgment as in being sent to hell, separated from God in hell. There is, of course, the great white throne judgment, which is the final judgment. But in Paul's writings, 1 Thessalonians especially, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, he is specifically talking about the coming of the Lord. And he's specifically talking about that time period where there is going to be this man of sin who's going to be, you know, uh, doing all of these things up until the Lord comes to execute judgment on those who do not obey the gospel. So, and Paul says, we, he will deliver us from the wrath to come in the context of the coming of the Lord and this Antichrist or the man of sin being on the earth, in that context, we can say, hey, it includes this judgment that's going to be poured out on the earth during the tribulation, the wrath to come. It includes that. He's not going to just leave us on the earth to go through the tribulation, but he's coming to take us away to be with him so that we can be delivered from the judgment that's going to come on the earth. Right? So that's the second reason why we say, you know, in, in Thessalonians, in the context of all that Paul has given, he says two times, God doesn't want us to go through the judgment, through the wrath to come, but to experience salvation through Jesus Christ. Now we understand it's a very broad term, judgment, but judgment includes in Scripture the seven years of tribulation, which is judgment on the earth. And like I said, it includes eternal judgment. It includes the great white throne judgment. So God doesn't want us to go through that. He wants us to experience salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, he says twice, he says, comfort each other. Comfort each other. 
right? The first Thessalonians chapter four, again first Thessalonians chapter five, comfort each other. So what would bring us comfort? Knowing that we're going to go through the tribulation, be here with the uh, Antichrist, or knowing that, hey, we're going to be with the Lord. They're going to escape all of this, and we're going to be with the Lord. That's going to bring us comfort, right? So putting these in context of what he's been teaching the Thessalonians, we say uh, we will not be here for the tribulation. The third reason is what Jesus promised. Uh, let's try to finish this. Um, I, let's see, we have a few more minutes here. Um, is it what Jesus promised to the church uh, uh, in Revelation chapter 3, the church in Philadelphia? This was the only church that Jesus didn't rebuke. Right? And what, is, what did he tell them? He said, because you've kept my commandment, I will keep you from the hour of trial which will come on the whole earth to test all who dwell on the earth. He said, I will keep you from the hour of trial. He didn't say, I will you know, um, let you go through it. I'll take you out of, so that out of, What's he talking about? He's talking about something that's going to come on the whole earth. So the only thing that's going to affect the whole earth in that context of revelation is the seven years of tribulation. So we are understanding this verse in the context of what has been given, which is what is given in the book of Revelation. What is the thing that is going to come on the whole world? Seven years of tribulation. It's the hour of trial. It's going to be, you know, it's tribulation. It's going to, it's going to be a very difficult time. And what's Jesus saying? I'm going to keep you out of it. Okay, now. We understand that the Lord was speaking to the church at that time. But remember what he was speaking to the church in Philadelphia is for the church, which is for all believers. Right? He's telling them, I'm coming quickly and I don't want anyone to take your crown. Right? And that's not only for them, it's for all believers. Right? So although this, these are words he spoke to the church in, Revela um, the church in Philadelphia in Revelation 3, the promises for all the church is going to keep us from the hour of trial. So that's the third reason. He clearly stated, I will keep you from the hour of trial, which is going to affect the whole earth. How do we know what the hour of trial is? Well, it's the rest of the book of Revelation. That's the context in which this is given. And the rest of Revelation talks about the seven years of tribulation. Okay? So, Let's pause here. We'll go for our 10 minute break and come and uh, we'll go to the remaining reasons. And, uh, you know, we will also take up any questions for discussion. Okay. I hope you're following me. I hope things are clear. Uh, please don't hesitate to ask any questions. Let's come back in 10 minutes, please. <laughs> 